Good morning. good morning good morning everyone really good to see you on this slightly dull and rainy day but we it's good to be here meeting together uh, uh wherever you are uh, but meeting together online uh, as you can see it's myself and sandra today we're in church there's abby at home she's going to be doing our talk later we're very pleased that stan and rosemary mccarthy they're going to be doing the prayers later on so uh that's fantastic thanks guys appreciate that um, just to say, uh, we are uh, 
It's Trinity Sunday, uh, but today we're beginning a, a new series in the book of Acts. series that we're going to be looking at. Also, as we begin, I just want to bring you a really, a really excited a message from Jean Bosco from our partner parish in Mauricio. And uh, I'll see if I can find that for you, see a picture of him. Uh, let me see. Fantastic. The money we gave to the people of our partnership church and because of the coronavirus they can't find jobs at the moment because they have very kind of a broken kind of existence in that village, particularly in Rwanda. So that's that's wonderful. Really pleased about that. Also want to mention uh, that I'm sure you saw it that we we're beginning to do stay and play uh, once a week on a Wednesday after our morning service. That's for 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 toddlers and for their mums. And we had a great time for the first time this week. You saw the ad, I'm sure, as you were waiting. So that was a fantastic thing that uh, that's happening this week and every week. Heard someone say uh, this week that Christians are Sunday people. Sunday people, that doesn't mean we all get up late and we're, you know, we're kind of slightly lazy and laid back. Well, of course, that might be the case, but that's not what he meant. They meant that we celebrate the first day of the week. Now, many people think of the first day as Monday, but Sunday is the first day of the week because it, it was the day that God created. It was the God day that Jesus came back from the dead and new creation began. And so we're Sunday people. We celebrate potential creativity and new creation. I really like that idea. Even when we're feeling not great, and I don't know about you, it's been up and down this week, we know that we are the people of Sunday. We're Sunday people. And I think that's exciting. Also, just to say, many of you may have seen in the news about uh, uh, churches opening for private prayer Monday next. Please stay. And uh, at the moment, we're going to be um, working that out through the PCC. If you keep looking on our website or keep looking at Facebook, we'll update you during the week and we'll t let you know more about how we're going to progress on that next Sunday. OK. OK. So we're going to express that sense of being Sunday people uh, through some songs of worship now. And uh, we're gathering wherever we are in different places to, to worship God together. We gather for him.
just welcomed God into the space that we are in this morning. We're in church, you're at home, wherever you are, you have just welcomed Jesus alongside you in that space. We're worshipping him this morning. There is such power in the name of Jesus. And if you're feeling powerless this morning with everything that's happening for us or not happening for us, then know through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus' name is powerful. And he is right here with us in the space that we are in, Jesus Christ himself. And in his name, we pray this morning that God's power will move in this nation, in the world. Oh Jesus, we welcome you into this place and we praise you that your name is powerful. Let's sing another song of worship. Build my life.
build our life on the solid rock. We will not be shaken. Because we know in whom we believe. We know in whom we were saved. And are being saved. Amen. Well, it's time for our time of confession now. And we always have an all-age confession. It's a simple and straightforward confession, but you know, we're, sometimes we're, we need to remember we're certainly many simple and straightforward people. And so to come before God and say, Lord, we, we know we can base our life on you, but we know that we fall and we make mistakes. And so this is where we come before God and each week say we're sorry, knowing that we are forgiven. Almighty God, our Father, we come to you with sad hearts to tell you that we have done wrong things and to ask for your forgiveness. For wanting to live our lives our own way, Lord, we're sorry. Forgive us. For not doing as we are told, Lord, we're sorry. Forgive us. For not sharing our things, Lord, we're sorry. Forgive us for not telling the truth. Lord, we're sorry. Forgive us for being jealous or cruel. Lord, we're sorry. Forgive us. Father, we have often done wrong and we ask you to forgive us. Help us to live lives, live our lives in such a way that others may see your glory in our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of hope and power forgive us and free us from all our sins in the powerful and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now it is time for our story. Are there any children out there? If you come closer in, I'm sure you'll enjoy this as we think about the story that we're thinking about today as our first part of our series in Acts. So, okay, I think I might have the wrong picture already, but anyway. Of you, Sanj. I've got a slight issue in that my phone's just told me that there's low power mode going on so I really hope that it doesn't run out otherwise we'll have to go to a plan B. Anyway here we go let's, let's just whiz through this before my phone runs out. So Jesus had gone back to heaven to be with his father God and the Holy Spirit had come. The new church was growing and growing and growing and more and more people were believing in Jesus every single day. It must have been so exciting for the disciples. So they were still in Jerusalem and Peter and John went to the temple to pray. It was three o'clock in the afternoon. That was one of the proper times for Jewish people to pray in the temple. And as they came to the gate to the temple, the gate was called Beautiful. That was its name. As they came to the gate called Beautiful, they saw a man sitting there. The man couldn't walk. He'd never been able to walk. And he would sit at the Beautiful gate every day at this time, so that he could ask people for money as they walked past him. It was his only way of having money to buy food to eat every day. So his friends probably brought him there. Maybe they were going to the temple to pray too. And they would place him at the gateway, named Beautiful, and they'd come back for him later. Maybe they prayed for their friends. I hope that they did. Do you pray? your friends. I do. Anyway, Peter and John were coming to the gate where he was sitting and he called out to them politely whilst looking down at the ground. Please, have you got any change? Peter and John looked right at the man who couldn't walk and Peter said, hey, look up at us, look up. The man did, hoping that this might mean he would be given something. But Peter said, 
I don't, I don't have any money to give to you, but actually I have something better that I can give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And as he said that to the man, he reached out to hold his right hand and help him up. As he did so, the man's legs and his feet suddenly became strong and the man got up. No, he didn't get up. He jumped up. The Bible says he jumped up and he walked. <laughs> Overjoyed, the man went with Peter and John into the temple courts. And as he went, he was walking and leaping and praising God out loud, very loud. And everyone noticed. And Peter and John were probably grinning joyfully from ear to ear as the man praised Jesus, showing off his new strong legs. He didn't care what people were thinking. He was too happy and excited at what had happened for him in that moment. And he was full of thanks and praise for Jesus, bursting with it. And as the people watched, they were just absolutely amazed. They recognised the man who used to sit at the gate, looking at the ground, asking for money. He was always there, every single day, and they just actually walked past him only a few minutes ago. Here he was right now, on his feet, all of a sudden, healed and jumping around, so excited and so happy. They couldn't understand it. Something incredible had happened. The end. Well, grateful the phone <laughs> kept going. Thanks, Sandra, once again for telling our story today. I know Abby's going to uh, continue on the bit after this story. So, uh, just it's good for us to remember that story as we go ahead with the rest of our service together. So now I'm going to read out our passage from today, which is the follow-on after. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them, to the place called Solomon's Colonnade. And when Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servants, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and disowned him before Pilate. But he had decided to let, to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and you asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can see, as you can all can see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that the Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And that he may send the Messiah, who has been appointed to you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through the holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me among your own people, and you must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him, will be completely cut off from the people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. 
He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now I'll pass over to Abby for our time of reflection. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we pray that you would open this word up to us this morning, that you would show us what we need to hear from it, and that you would take these words and speak into all of our hearts this morning. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So along with uh, unprecedented, which I believe is a banned word in the vicarage these days, uh, social distance, um, I think new normal is a, a phrase that's seeped in to almost every conversation, certainly every news report, every article I read, new normal is the phrase of the moment. And I guess it recognises that we're not going to be doing things normally for a really long time. You know, many of us will have found new rhythms of life. Uh, you know, perhaps the world has become a bit smaller. And lots of people are talking about whether we should actually ever go back to the way things were, whether actually there's lessons to learn from this lockdown time. Perhaps we should be looking for a long term new normal. Well, you know, we just celebrated Pentecost last Sunday, as you know, when the Holy Spirit fell on all who called on the name of Jesus. And we're now returning our thoughts to the impact of that, to the, how the brand new Christian church led by Peter and the other apostles established its new normal in the middle of doubts and uncertainty and actually sometimes open hostility from those around them. And we're going to think about the effect that that baptism of the Holy Spirit and all that it led them to do in Jesus name. We're going to think about what was important in the first church, where there were no church buildings, no internet or live streaming. And we're going to try and learn from how they lived and worked together to glorify the name of Jesus. And maybe somewhere in these first few chapters of the book of Acts, maybe in there somewhere will be the key to our new normal, either as individuals or as a church family. So today, today's reading, when we boil it down, actually, I think there are three key sets of people who are challenged and affected by the power of Jesus in this account of the healing of the lame man. And there are three different new normals, if you like, that Luke, the writer of Acts, is showing us. Now, firstly, perhaps most clear cut is the man who was healed by Peter and John's authoritative command to get up and walk in the name of Jesus. His encounter with the Holy Spirit has left his life looking completely different from how it did even that morning. The first line in today's passage says that he held on to Peter and John. Uh, in other translations, it says he clung to them. And it, it's Probably, he's probably a bit shell-shocked, isn't he? A bit bewildered. I bet he can't quite believe what's just happened. I wonder if he was worried, if he was worried that if he let go of them, somehow that healing would just go away. But of course, that's not the case. He'd spend the rest of his life leaping and walking. And he'd spend the rest of his life knowing what God had done for him through Peter and John and the power of the Holy Spirit working in them. Yeah, his new normal was a life of possibility, the like of which he'd never seen before. That limitless possibility of the Holy Spirit that I was talking about last week. He wasn't ever again going to need people to carry him to the beautiful gate in the morning to beg. 
He could walk, he could worship, he could travel, he could live independently, he could work, all because of the power of the name of Jesus. At work in him, through the Holy Spirit. Are you being called, are we being called to a new normal full of possibilities that seemed distant, maybe even weeks ago or months or years? It's the Holy Spirit showing you a new way of living. It might not be physical healing like this man, but it could be anything. Maybe like the lame man, it's something that you've longed for for a long time. Maybe it's something that had never occurred to you until this last little while. Maybe it's a new way of walking with Jesus. If that's the case, then explore these possibilities. Let your life be transformed. Cling on to those who might help you to get there. But most of all, cling on to the Lord. Spend time with him. Let the, let the spirit fill you with his love and his presence, showing you the way. Secondly, second new normal. Peter and John, well, they're already living this new normal that they've been presented with. You know, they've been part of this movement that has swept through Jerusalem since the Holy Spirit fell on them. And I wonder if they're still trying to understand, still trying to process what's gone on in their lives in the last couple of months. I think some of us could probably sympathise what's actually just happened. They're probably still getting used to this new way of being. You know, only a month ago, they've been locked down themselves, terrified, fearing for their lives. Now here they are, publicly healing people, speaking in tongues, proclaiming the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. And all because of the Spirit's power and authority. As they walked to the temple that day, I wonder if they had a sense that they're not just a, a sort of dynamic duo anymore. They're a holy trio. Because the spirit is with them. Now, Peter's becoming a bold speaker. In this passage, we see him pulling no punches, do we? He's pretty hard hitting. The new normal for the apostles was a life where this kind of sharing of the gospel, the uncomfortable gospel, the truth, was becoming commonplace where healing in Jesus' name was happening, where walking in the power of the Holy Spirit was just how they lived. Their new normal was a life full of courage and authority and boldness for the sake of the message that they've been commissioned to spread. Their new normal was living a life that constantly pointed to Jesus and the love that's revealed in him. I wonder if that's how we see our lives. I wonder if that courage and that boldness is something that we long for, maybe. Because it doesn't always feel easy, does it? I'm going to have a little confession time now. I have a horrible case of imposter syndrome. Now, I can second guess myself out of good things because I don't feel like I deserve them or because I don't think I'm good enough or experienced enough to do things that actually I, I know in my head I'm perfectly capable of. I've spent a good proportion of the last few years thinking I was somehow not good enough or right for things. And it still rears its head. God's done lots of work in me, but it still rears its head. Live streaming twice a week. Well, Abby says that little voice in my head, you know, you don't look right for live streaming. You, know, you trip over your words. You're going to make mistakes. How could you possibly serve God on live streaming? And I know I'm not fishing for compliments, by the way. I know how ludicrous it sounds. <laughs> and I know that none of the stuff matters. I know that I'm being called to serve in this way at this time in this place. But this is a voice that I still need God's spirit to help me fight against. And I think God is giving me opportunities to make steps in that. 
but it takes the spirit's provision of courage and boldness and confidence still to say yes to things that my own brain is telling me that I either couldn't or shouldn't do, even when I know that's not true. I want my new normal to be a life of saying yes to what God is giving me to do without second guessing him and myself first. And I, I wonder, I wonder, did Peter and John have similar thoughts, similar doubts, similar voices in their heads? I'm sure that there were moments where Peter remembered all too clearly denying Jesus three times the night before he died. Amongst many other gaffes and mistakes. I'm sure John cringed every time he thought about fighting with his brother about who was best who was greater in front of Jesus. There will have been moments, I am certain of it, where they've stopped in their tracks and thought, are they really the right people to do this job, to lead this church? But over and over again, it seems that the spirit is walking with them, reminding them who they are, and more importantly, whose they are. And that gives them the boldness and the confidence to step up. Where do we need more of that boldness and confidence from the spirit? Where do we need reminding who we are and whose we are? And then the third new normal in this passage is actually a less comfortable one. It's the one that the crowds are presented with. In the lame man, God has comforted the disturbed. And it's a bit of a preaching cliche, but I'm going to use it anyway. I would say that in the crowd here, God is disturbing the comfortable. There's been a bit of disturbing the comfortable in the kind of social media and in the press this, this last couple of weeks in the light of all the, of the, the race issue that we're yet again confronted with. My comfortable has been disturbed. And I think that's what Peter is doing here. And it's important that we let it happen. You know, Peter reminds them this isn't some anonymous power at work. But it's the same power. It's, in fact, it's the same person that they called on Pilate to destroy. And it isn't some anonymous stranger who's been healed, but it's a man that they've walked past every day at the beautiful gate. Some of them may even have helped carry him there in the mornings. They can't dismiss this as something, as something that doesn't touch their lives because it's right at the heart of their everyday existence. It's personal. So it will be uncomfortable. The crowd's new normal, now they've witnessed this scene, heard Peter's words, is going to be a life of having to make a choice about things that they already thought they knew. You know, should they believe their eyes? Do they accept the sight, this extraordinary sight of a man who couldn't walk that morning, able to walk and leap now? Or do they dismiss what's happened as some kind of scam that Peter and John and the man are all in cahoots with? Do they accept that it's all happening because of Jesus or do they ignore all the prophecies that Peter mentions? All the prophecies that seem to be coming true in front of them. Do they accept that they made this terrible, horrible mistake in not believing Jesus was who he said he was? Just as Peter reminds them they did. This is personal. They knew Jesus. They know the man who was lame. It's not an academic exercise. They can't ignore it. And the next bit of choice, if they accept all that Peter is telling them, how should they respond? Some of you will know the story of Les Miserables, either from the book or the show or the film. And, and there's a scene where Jean Valjean, who's a convict on probation, has stolen silver from a bishop but he's not been given up to the police in fact the bishop actually gives him more silver and tells him to take the second chance that he's been offered 
And the extraordinary scene, straight after this in the musical version, shows Valjean arguing with himself and actually with a God that he'd pretty much given up on. Why should he accept this grace and mercy that he's been offered? What will that mean in his life? Almost, you know, how dare the bishop forgive him, offer him mercy, give him a second chance? How dare he? Now, in the film, Hugh Jackman acts this brilliantly, I think, and it's almost painful to watch the reluctance in this man to accept the grace he's been given. Grace. It seems such an obvious thing to accept. But of course it isn't, is it? Pride gets in the way. Life experience, guilt, bitterness, prejudice, doubt, fear. And I wonder if the crowd were feeling those things at the temple that day. Were they going to spend their lives wondering and trying to explain away all these miracles that are happening in front of them? Are they too proud to accept that they might have got it wrong about Jesus? Were they going to live a sort of heart, double, kind of well, doubt-filled sort of half-life instead of a life full of confidence, a life lived with bitterness and prejudice, or were they going to choose a different kind of normal? Would they choose to accept Peter's invitation to repent and believe? Now, at the end of this scene in Les Miserables, Valjean accepts that it's not too late for him to take this second chance. Now, we don't see with how the crowd respond. We see how the authorities respond at the end of this passage. They haul Peter and John off. So we don't get a chance to see how they respond. But the question in my mind is, have they accepted it's not too late for them? That all is not lost? Now, Peter's reminded them that the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, our God, is a God of second chances. And it, we see it throughout scripture. Peter tells the crowd they have an opportunity to face up to what they've done and to turn back to Jesus. That regardless of everything they've done to push him away, that the Lord is still for them. I did a, a retreat, an online retreat, with uh, which Bishop John led yesterday, and he mentioned the song, The Blessing, which a lot of you, probably most of you, will have seen now. It's gone viral across the world. It's really caught a moment in these strange times. And one of the things that Bishop John was saying was that he felt that there's something in that song about reminding us whatever we have decided about God or not, that God is for us. There's a line in it, God is for you. He always was, he always will be, he is for us. We just have to acknowledge that and turn back to him. You know, the word repent comes from a root that implies leaning one way or the other. And Peter's challenge to the crowd, the decision that they're going to have to make is whether they live this new normal, leaning on Jesus, receiving his spirit. Or not. We have that same decision to make. Every day. Is our normal, our new normal maybe for some of us? going to be a life spent leaning on Jesus, not leaning on the things that have held us up in the past, money or status or power or the security, the safety of our own opinions, but a life lived leaning on Jesus, powered by his spirit and filled with the love of the Father. You know, this Trinity Sunday, when we think about it, the three in one God, it's not too late for us either. Our God is all about second chances, even if we think we've blown it, just like Peter would have done over and over again. And just like some of the crowd who have been listening to Peter would have done. Even if we think we've blown it, there's always time to repent and believe, time to accept that God the Father is, always was and always will be for us. Time to accept Jesus back into our lives, 
may be back into our lives as he reveals the love of the Father to us. Time to give the Spirit free reign to work in us and change us. You know, the man standing in front of the crowd, clinging on to Peter and John, he's proof of that. It's not too late. Peter and John themselves, fueled by the Spirit, working in the name of Jesus, they're proof of that. It's never too late. If you feel Jesus calling to you, today maybe even, don't live a half life full of doubt and fear. Don't not make that decision to follow him, to lean on him. If you feel him there, then invite him in, lean on him, make your new normal life a life spent walking with him, leaning on him in the light of his truth, empowered, emboldened, enabled by his spirit. That's the reality of the man who can now walk. That's Peter and John's new normal too. And that's the reality of the new normal that is being offered to the crowd that day. As Peter says in this passage, Jesus died and was raised from the dead and now lives and walks with us by his spirit. In light of that fact, nothing, nothing can ever be the same again. So let's try to live as if, it, let's stop trying to live as if it could be. Let's instead live in the glorious light that this truth brings on our lives and the lives of those around us. Let's embrace this new normal, whatever that looks like in our lives, take it out to others, like the man who could now walk did, leaping and dancing and praising God. Amen.
generations and your family and your children and the children and the children and his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your calling and your going We're going to proclaim our faith in the God who loves us in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe in God who made the world and loves it. We believe that he came into the world in the person of Jesus who was both God and man and who died on the cross so that we could be friends with God. We believe that Jesus rose from death and gives life to all those who trust him. We believe that Jesus will come back and that everyone who trusts him will live with God forever. We believe in the Holy Spirit who lives in us and helps us to live as God wants. We believe in the church, people who live for God in this world. Amen. I'm going to pass over now to Rosemary and Stan who are going to lead us in our time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for our long periods of good weather, which has given us the opportunity to get outdoors and wonder at the beautifulness of May. So many plants in bright colour trees producing signs of fruit and now thank you for the rain that is bringing much needed relief to our dry gardens and countryside thank you for birdsong and all the glory of your creation and thank you too for the wonders of technology which is keeping people connected thank you for matt and abby and for all they are doing to bring us God's word, keep church family in touch and reaching the wider community. Thank you, Lord, for the richness of their encouragement and teaching. Bless them and all volunteers using the technology to keep connected with our youth and now the toddlers from play and stay. Bless their efforts, Lord, and may many respond and enjoy. Amen. We pray, Lord, that the Open Heaven Prayer Initiative in Coventry receives a huge response and that our city be bathed in loving, powerful prayer. You know, Lord, that we at St Martin's have long prayed for our streets where we live. May we feel compelled to continue to pray blessings and healing upon our neighbours and our city. As our Alpha course continues online, we pray for those leading and for the participants. 
may they inch ever closer to an understanding of your amazing love and presence in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, yeah, hear our prayer. our prayer. We continue to pray for the well-being of all doctors and nurses and frontline workers involved in treating COVID-19 patients. Lord, keep them strong physically and mentally. We pray for those who have to conquer the fear of going to work, whether in care homes or hospitals or other places offering essential services. Grant them the courage and the protection that they require. Lord, we ask you to keep them all safe. We pray for those who are anxious about jobs and income and fear for the future. For the unemployed, those laid off, those facing redundancy and the underemployed. May they know that they are valued by you, Lord, and may they be encouraged and supported by others. We pray for all those continuing in isolation who long for company, the elderly, those with health problems, and for those who are just too afraid to leave their homes, afraid to mix with others no matter what the distance. Lord, in your mercy, yeah, hear pray. our prayer. We pray for all teaching staff who are preparing for the return of children to school over the next few weeks. May their preparations be thorough and their strategies workable. We pray for parents who will be worrying and we pray for our youngsters who will be going back into a very different environment and will carry concerns of their own. Lord, walk alongside all of them and please quell their anxieties, Lord, and keep them all safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We now bring before you the horrific scene recently witnessed in Minnesota and the unrest and division that has ensued. And as we recall the words of Martin Luther King Jr. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only the light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. We pray, creator of all people, in our amazing diversity of size, shape, color, and giftedness. Guide us by your grace, giving us gifts of humility and generosity of spirit to recognize in all people the face of our Savior Jesus and to practice his commandment to love one another toward the end of bringing harmony and peace among persons of all colours, origins and abilities for the sake of your kingdom. And thinking of that new normal of uncomfortableness. Lord, send your Holy Spirit in power across the world, especially in the United States, to challenge all. O oh Lord God, for those who are white, help us to stand up as an ally for those of colour. May we step up if witnessing racial abuse. Help all to be conscious of our own privilege and may we listen attentively. And O oh Lord, for those who are people of colour, when safe and feeling comfortable enough, help us to lovingly call out white friends and colleagues on their unnoticed bias. And may those so challenged, challenged respond in love. O oh, good and gracious God, you invite us to see your divine image and likeness in our neighbour. Enable us to see the reality of racism and free us to challenge and uproot it from our society, our world and ourselves. May we see all as equals as you do. 
your love is unconditional for all. May we see others through your eyes as your children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our okay. prayer. And Holy Spirit, please help and guide all those challenged by the issues presented by this latest horrific example of racism. Help us all to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, our prayer. We take a moment now to pray for those who are unwell at the moment. And we pray your blessings and your healing upon John Bint, Richard and Tish Morris, Jill's parents, Pam Worsley, Gail Brigden, Jeff Court, Bill Warren, Anne Goff, Roger Gillett, Jack Olds, Greg Smith, Gideon, James Griffiths, Nick Williams, Alan Simpson, Elizabeth Carr, Lindy, Heather and Helen Walker. And in a moment of quiet, we bring others before you, Lord, that we wish to pray for. We hold in our prayers those who have recently lost loved ones, and we think in particular of the family and friends of Mark Elton and Angela. And Lord, as we begin a new week, loving Father, may we not forget that in you we are significant, secure and accepted. Jesus, Son of God, Help us to shine your light each day and follow your perfect example. Holy Spirit, fill us and equip us each day with your holy gifts. Glory be to the three persons of the Holy Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you both. The, the collect for today. Holy God, faithful and unchanging, enlarge our minds with the knowledge of your faith, your truth, and draw us more deeply into the mystery of your love, that we may truly worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And now we're going to join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, thank you everyone for taking part in our service today. Thank you, Abby, for your, for your message that the Lord gave you. Thank you to Rosemary and Stan for their prayers. We're, it's Trinity Sunday, and uh, so we, we need to make sure we sing a Trinitarian uh, hymn to finish with. Hopefully, Holy Sandra. Oh, great. There we go. I think this is the most Trinitarian hymn I could find, so I hope Jean uh, can Mistress is happy with it. I'm not particularly happy with my playing on the guitar, but anyway, I'll do my best. <laughs> Oh, oh. 
So we end our time together with the blessing, a blessing that we've been using during lockdown. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with us wherever he may send us. May he guide us through the wilderness, protect us through the storm. May he bring us home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown us. May he bring us home rejoicing once again into our doors. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Shall we say together the words of the grace. May the grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We will be meeting again on Zoom for our coffee. So if you've not got the link for that, please just contact us and we'll send that to you. And we look forward to seeing you then. Don't forget this week at uh, 10 o'clock on a Wednesday is our uh, time of worship, prayer and reflection, followed by Stay and Plays. We're excited about doing that again this week. So do have a good day and may the Lord bless you.